I'm very pleased to welcome Michelle Moon into the NSCDA Zoom room. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I am so pleased to be here speaking with all of you. I have to kind of imagine uh, most of you as I uh, see your names in the gallery, but um, I really hope that we'll be able to follow up and get to know one another in the future. Um, my name is Michelle Moon and I am a consultant for museums and historic sites and I specialize in the topic of food history and I'm delighted to be speaking with you today because I love food and I know a lot of people do and I think that we can use food related topics to our benefit at historic sites with such reward from the audience uh, who bring curiosity, familiarity, and excitement to this topic. So I'm really thrilled uh, to hear a bit about what you're doing, I hope, as we go, and to invite you in to this world. And I hope suggest some ideas that um, may be new for you. Um, so what I'm going to do is get ready to share my screen here and uh, present to you a few slides that I hope will um, give some ideas for getting, getting going and getting on our way. Um, so just give me one moment to do that sharing in the welcome table. The power of food programming at historic homes. So um, I have been working with food at historic sites for quite some time. Uh, I began my career at Mystic Seaport and have worked in places like Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, um, and in other museums with historic homes like the Tenement Museum and the Newark Museum of Art, uh, which includes the Ballantine House. And so I've really been delighted to see how powerful food programming can be. And I'm an advocate for presenting it with a very contemporary lens to connect with the way people think about and access food information today. So this first image is of Strawberry Bank, and this is where I really kind of caught the gospel of the power of food. It's uh, a site with a number of 18th century homes on a riverside in a New England city, and we're fortunate to have some of the um, first apple trees that were planted there by the earliest colonists uh, beginning back in 1695. So their, their scions, uh, their relations are still living here and still producing the Roxbury russet apples that those first colonists brought with them as a, um, and, and developed here, I should add, as a, you know, a way to actually taste something that came from the past. On this site, we benefited from having a number of recreated kitchen gardens with heirloom vegetables, with culinary and medicinal herbs, uh, with orchard trees, and that enabled us to present an active and really rich and in-depth food program on the site. I know that food programming is not necessarily new to the Colonial Dames. Um, we are, you are among many organizations that have done a lot with food in the past. And so in many ways, everything old is new again. And this is a return to a legacy and a tradition that your organizations have. These are just three cookbooks out of what I understand are dozens and dozens of produced by, um, and as CDA chapters over the years, uh, going back, you know, the earliest years, 1952, and they run up through the 1970s, and I'm sure onward, and in the days before the readily available food blog and internet um, access to recipes that makes this so easy now, these cookbooks were terrific fundraisers, and also terrific ways to gather and reflect the food heritage and history of a region, and feature unique ingredients, cultural traditions, um, communities that may have brought foodways with them from uh, a past in another place. So this really uh, speaks to ways that where this may have been the way uh, that food knowledge was shared in the past, it also can inspire where we're going in the present and future. And why should we do this? Well, food is pretty powerful. Um, even if you weren't connecting to it, you know, on your own personal level, your audiences are connected to food. I often cite this survey uh, by Susie Wilkening, who uh, conducted this a little over five years ago, and she studied about 7,500 museum visitors and cultural consumers. People are active in, in cultural learning, and she found an overwhelming interest in food. 51% of her respondents 
put that forward as something they were especially interested in as a pastime. A full third of them said they enjoyed cooking at home, and a third said they enjoyed eating cultural or historical foods as a way of experiencing history. And out of that group, 14% chose both of those responses. And Susie called those the super foodies. Uh, the super foodies are not only really into food, but they're also very, very active in food learning and in um, exploring the world with that lens. They are uh, good visitors to know. They tend to be under the age of 50. They often have younger children um, or often travel and, and do cultural activities in groups. Um, they love hands-on experiences. Many of them are crafters, are gardeners, are sewers, are builders. And so they're really eager for opportunities to learn about new food um, practices. So these are powerful visitors. We know that it's uh, women who make most decisions to visit cultural sites, and that intersects very significantly with this group of food interested visitors. One of the, the comments in Susie's survey is one that I really treasure. Um, at the risk of sounding gluttonous, I would say I enjoy any history experience where I get to taste the past. I love food and almost everyone else does too, but some won't admit it. And I have a very strong association with food and memory. So it gives us some sense of what draws people in to food. And if any of you do have cooking programs on your site, um, festivals with food, open hearth cooking, then you know um, often it's hard for people to tear themselves away to any space where there are the sights and smells and sounds of food. Um, we also know that food connects really well with younger audiences, and I'm sure you're all engaged in discussions about how important it is for our organizations today to connect with those audiences and build the habit of going out to cultural organizations, of treasuring our history, learning our history, and seeing that as part of a rich social life. And we're lucky um, in that younger adults, some of those we are looking to engage in the coming years, um, they already really are interested in food and they value it perhaps more highly than previous generations have. They've grown up in a world with Food Network on television, um, with you know, wonderful access to new kinds of food and fusion cuisines and the British baking show and all sorts of things that have really um, helped to amplify interest in food. So they're more likely to seek out that kind of content, which means not only reading food blogs and watching it on TV, but looking for places locally that they can go and learn something new, something um, they might enjoy incorporating into their own lifestyles. We also know that this generation sees food in a wider way, um, not just sustenance, but they think about food in relation to health and nutrition, to environmental sustainability, and to how food links us to cultural stories and to our identities. So this is an audience that we would love to see at, more of at our historic sites and to see staying engaged. And food is one way to their hearts. They ask to be engaged about food and they are not afraid to look at some of the more contentious issues or um, difficult questions about our food history. So I'm going to pause here and ask everybody to do a little bit of participating. This is an image from Colonial Williamsburg, and it just shows the kind of, um, you know, late uh, 18th century parlor that many of you might have seen or be familiar with or have something very similar to at your own sites. So I'm just going to ask you to cast your eyes over the room and notice some of the things that are laid out and the objects you can see. And I'd love to ask if you would to, oops, sorry, to use our chat function um, to answer a couple of questions that I'm going to just prompt you with. So one is, I would love for you to imagine what people might be in this scene. If we imagine this in its own time period um, as a living scene, who, who would be in this space? Feel free to drop a few comments in chat. Take out a notepaper, jot down, um, just so to get your thoughts going. So we hear about a family, ladies of the home, women, important visitors. Lots about ladies, the owners of the family who reside here, some servants, uh, not much room for big men. So interesting, think on too about the uh, expect outside visitors, China is too good for kids. 
nice eye there. Um, think about the the sight, sounds, and smells as as this room is populated with these people in our imagination. Um, women having tea, perhaps. Uh, what, as you look around the room, what would be uh, in the air? The aromas that people might experience when they come in. Beautiful. The crackling fire, the tea, sweetness from the sugar, the smoke, um, ginger and cloves. We can see some of those on the side table. Um, some wonderful baked goods that look like they are decorated with cloves and we might have some ginger in these cookies. So we're, we're hearing about some spices, um, lavender perhaps to fragrance the room. Excellent. So you are all really good at bringing this, this vividly to life. There might be some perfumes. Um, if the, the room is full of people, we might, be, we might be picking that up as well as any other aromas they may carry on them. Um, so yeah, there's a really rich sensory environment here. And this room uh, is helping us to see that. Um, so we are able to take a look at the tea service, at the baked goods, the spoons laid out, the candle, and understand a bit about what might be going on here. But I want to kind of freeze this in your mind because we will be coming back to this room to see, um, we're gonna try on a new set of lenses to look at this with and see how that might enrich or change the story that we can tell here. So I will um, close up the chat for now and move on to this um, concept that I'm eager to share with you. So in food history, there are a couple of ways that uh, food historians have distinguished to look at the past. One of them is under the, on the left-hand column, it says culinary history. And culinary history is something that I think most of us are probably very familiar with as museum um, people who work with objects in real space. Culinary history teaches about or looks into questions about ingredients, methods, techniques, the tools that are used, the utensils that, that are used, the origins of the food, and maybe how cuisine is developed, how is food served, and how is it presented, and how are what are the unique qualities of each kind of cuisine or each type of meal in a day. So culinary history is very focused in. Um, it's really focused around material culture and the foodstuffs themselves and how to create them. Whereas looking over on the right, the other category that uh, historians will often work with is much broader. And food history in this category asks us to think about the social history of food. So in that case, it's the, oops, whoop, 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 um, culture, identity, the roles and status of um, the people involved with food. What is, how are they related to it? Do they work with it? Do they consume it? Both um, those kinds of questions. It also asks us to look at the power, um, who has power to determine where food goes, what food is, how much is available in a place, who has access to it, um, and economics, who can afford it, who can afford what kinds of food, what do the poor eat and the rich eat. Um, food history also asks us to look at the larger notion of food systems, which I'll kind of go into in a moment, and also looks at the environment and how the natural environment determines um, and helps to create the world of food that everyone lives in. So these are often presented as uh, two different approaches to food history. I think that our role as museums and historic sites is to blend these two. So that's why my little walnut slide is here because I think they're two halves of a whole. We do need culinary history on our sites because we do have expertise in material culture in how food is prepared or was prepared in unique historical ways that are very interesting to share with people and highly motivating for those food driven audiences. But we also have that responsibility as historical and educational organizations to place food in its wider context, not only what it was and how to make it, but what does it mean? What did it mean to people then? And what can it mean to us today? So to do that, I'm going to walk us through a notion of using food systems as a way of looking at the food stories that are on our historic sites. So moving forward here, um, we will take a look at these kinds of objects of material culture that probably surround you at your own sites, but we're also gonna back that lens out and look at that wider context, such as here at Mount Vernon, 
the Washington family having a lovely evening. Um, and in the kitchen there, perhaps the uh, person who cooked their meal uh, before the scene we just saw taking a pause and having a rest. So how can we bring all these stories together and put them all uh, in the light? I like to call the approach Beyond the Butter Churn. This was almost the title of um, a book I wrote with uh, Kathy Stanton, a food historian. And we really wanted to encourage historic sites to get beyond just the, the see it and try it method of giving people the hands-on experience of a butter churn and really get into the wider meaning. So what I mean when I talk about a food systems approach, um, food systems is a way of looking at that bigger picture of everything about food. And it's often defined uh, in some way that uses a metaphor of a web where a food system is this complex web of all the interactions that happen to create food and bring it to people to eat. So it goes beyond just the consumption or just the cooking and looks at every phase of the creation of a food culture. So if it begins anywhere, we would say it probably begins in the realm of production in this purple bubble. And food production, of course, has everything to do with the land and the labor it takes to grow um, or extract food from the earth. So of course, if we're going to look at food production, we certainly can begin to look at the history of our land itself, the land that your site is sitting on. There's probably an indigenous history to that that can be part of your story. Um, it may even be that there are still indigenous plants growing there um, that have long had food histories in the nation. So that's very, um, that's an interesting thing to explore if you do have land. Uh, food production, looking at the food production also involves looking at things like how the soil is kept healthy. What are the water resources? Are Is it spring fed? Is it near a river? Is it near an ocean? Um, what equipment is needed to harvest this food and grow this food and how much energy needs to be put into that system, especially today. Um, the question of energy is huge, but even looking into the past, the um, soil had to be cared for and replenished and was usually part of a very carefully managed system to continually re-nourish the soil. Um, so food production is one set of stories that we can look at long before we get to the table. The next bubble is processing, and that, of course, is getting food into a readier to eat state. Um, it's important to say here that each phase in the system doesn't necessarily only have to come in sequence. A lot of food is processed right after it comes out of the ground or off the boat or whatever it may be. It's processed to be ready for market, but then it, you know, it may be sent on for further processing and we may process it more at home. So flour and grain is a good example. Once grain is harvested, it is often um, rich find and enriched into flour and then that flour can come into your home and you can process it further into bread or maybe that flour is sold to a, a baker and the baker processes it into bread and then you bring it home and process it into bread pudding. So processing can happen almost throughout the whole cycle. Then uh, the distribution step is something that's important. And historically, this is where things can become very fascinating, especially in the colonial era where food distribution networks were rapidly expanding, new markets opening all the time, and people were quite eager to get their hands on new flavors, new tastes, and to be the first to adopt um, something that was not available years before and to really integrate that into um, a new cuisine. So looking at how food traveled around, um, what parts of that journey involved different kinds of shipping methods, whether that was by water, by barge, um, over land, that's a, a very fascinating story. And the distribution networks that resulted often mirror other political activities and the opening up of new um, era, uh, colonial market systems and so forth. And then the green dot, of course, is the one I think we're usually most familiar with and um, that's consuming. And of course, we consume food at our tables as did people in the past, but we can also think about all of the other places where food was playing a role and being consumed. Um, so that certainly includes in uh, historic times, we can talk about taverns, we can talk about the uh, dry goods sales um, 
shops that were available. We can talk about markets and the history of marketing and farmers markets in this era is really fascinating. Depending on where you are, um, it can be really intriguing to look at many of the controversies that happened around colonial farmers markets because they were often seen as um, places of degeneracy where there would be gambling, there would be drinking, uh, there was a lot of wheeling and dealing and often left a mess behind them when they packed up at the end of the day. So there's quite a bit of regulation that was going on um, to try to control some of the hazards of markets in that era. So that can all be very, very fascinating looking at the places that food is consumed. I will also note that any great venture that people were engaged in, like, um, getting a, a militia together or uh, sending a ship to hunt whales or sort of anything like that, provisioning is a necessary step. So there's almost no type of business venture or voyage or journey or large human gathering that could be undertaken without problem solving first. What kind of food will they have? How will it be preserved and survive safely through that journey? Um, and will, uh, how will we know that it will last long enough to keep them sustained? So consumption, of course, yields many, many stories. And then finally, and maybe a little more unexpectedly, um, there's a waste management component to food systems. What happens after the meal is done? Uh, there's food waste in every layer of the process. We still deal with this today, and it was uh, as true in the past. And we can look at how um, discards and scraps were treated in any historic house, where was the, where did that compost go? Was there a compost pile? Was there a privy? Was there a waterfall effect where the leftovers from a family meal on an elite table was then passed down or given to enslaved people or servants? So there are some interesting questions we can look at even in the food waste area. So I'm gonna go back to the Washington picture and highlight this time a figure in the background who is an enslaved woman and she's holding a tray. And as you can see in that circle, the tray has on it what looks to be a chocolate pot and a chocolate cup. And chocolate was really incredibly um, popular in this time period. So what I'd like to do is take a look at chocolate through this food systems lens and see what kinds of wider stories that might help reveal to us. So if we just look at the consumption of chocolate, um, it's no question that it was very popular during uh, the clo entire colonial era, beginning around 1680 when the first chocolate beans, uh, cacao beans, made their way to Boston. And people began to experiment with this beverage that had already caught on in Europe. And it took off in popularity for a lot of good reasons. Um, first, it's not intoxicating, uh, unlike a lot of colonial beverages and, and what most people were drinking most days, this did not cause drunkenness. Um, it also, it does have caffeine, but nowhere near the impact um, from that caffeine that you might have with a tea or a coffee. So it didn't also agitate the nerves uh, as people might have thought of it. It was also an incredibly nutritious drink and I, I know everyone will be happy to hear chocolate can be nutritious. And especially in this drinking form of um, what we might call hot chocolate today, it was loaded um, with antioxidants, of course, but people really understood and knew it for its nourishing value, just in terms of calories. It had lots of fats, and that meant that it was substantial. And there are quotations from people who would say, um, one cup of chocolate can carry you through the day. You won't need to eat again until supper time. Um, you could walk, you know, however many miles on this cup of chocolate. So people praised it for that, that nutritional value. It was fortifying um, and it made people feel well fed and stronger and satisfied. And that's um, all really important to why it was so popularly consumed. It was very popular with women um, and it was also a marker of status because chocolate was quite expensive. It was cheaper here than Europe, but it was still a luxury food. Um, so something that we see treated really beautifully in these kinds of um, objects, the, the chocolate pots that are so carefully crafted, often a beautiful silver. This one happens to be copper. Um, there were unique wares that you could buy to hold chocolate. And uh, every type of chocolate served was a little bit different. So we'll get to that more in a minute. So there's loads we could talk about if we just want to talk about chocolate consumption and how people ate and enjoyed chocolate in their homes, or not ate, but they drank and enjoyed chocolate in their homes. 
but let's back out and use more of the food systems lens and start thinking about what stories we might be able to bring in. Chocolate production is um, an endlessly fascinating topic. You can take whole travel tours on it, uh, but one place that was very important in the colonial, colonial period was Venezuela, where uh, chocolate was grown in vast numbers. Um, it's a jungle-grown food, and it was already an indigenous beverage at the time that it started to become popular for colonial settlements. And it was harvested in the history in much the same way that it is still harvested today. It's not highly industrialized. It's a hand harvested food. So as you see people here um, in Venezuela today, using a machete to take cocoa pods, cacao pods down from the trees, and then open them up to reveal the white beans inside that you can see in the hand of this woman in the foreground. Those white beans are coated in sort of a fleshy material that has to be fermented in order to reveal the bean, which is at the center of it. So after this harvest, there's a long period of fermentation, and then those fermented beans have to be washed and dried. So there are many weeks of processing before you even get a cacao bean. Once there was a cacao bean available, the next stage um, had to be distribution. And although this, this uh, engraving depicts sugar shipping, the mechanisms were exactly the same for chocolate, which involved um, putting them into heavy casks, uh, really packing these full and loading them onto vessels to be carried up to the markets in um, the US colonies in our case. And these are likely um, enslaved people who are doing this work both on both ends of the process, both uh, rolling, rolling and moving the casks around and handling the bulk goods and then sailing them um, back to the colonies. You know these men are sailors because they have a very typical red kerchief and blue coat, which is um, the mark of a merchant sailor. Um, and they are also likely enslaved people. So they would then take these schooners up to the markets in the Northeast typically and uh, by the time of the revolution the, in the 13 colonies, there were over 70 chocolate makers, uh, which is the name for the type of industrial um, processing that made chocolate ready for the table. Chocolate makers were located in all the major cities in Boston, Philadelphia. New York had a very large concentration of them in lower Manhattan. And many of the families who took on chocolate making as their business were immigrants from um, Europe and many of them were Sephardic Jews, some of them with names that are still very familiar in New York today, including Roosevelt, Van Zant. Um, some of those families became sort of um, created an empire of chocolate making in New York. And what they would do or take the raw beans that you can see scattered around the outside of this image and flavor those and create a product that you could take into your home. And the process involved a lot of steps. So first, these the, the beans themselves are hard. They need to be ground um, in order to have something you can work with. So they were first ground on a stone to create a paste. You get a very oily paste, which is absolutely bitter tasting and very unpleasant. So that needed to be seasoned. And what they would do is come up with a proprietary formula for their own unique brand of chocolate, each one a little bit different. And typical flavors would include white sugar, um, brown sugar, so there's a note of molasses. There is mace, um, nutmeg, sometimes allspice or anise. And uh, often down here, as you can see, a little bit of chili and salt. So all of those things went into um, prepared chocolate. That that paste from the beans on all of the spices were a uh, kind of a sticky paste that had to be poured into molds and set. And at that point in the processing, it could be sold, usually wrapped in paper, and then you could take it back home where that consumption could happen. And here uh, two interpreters from Colonial Williamsburg are showing how chocolate might have been prepared at home uh, by a couple of women. And why are they cooking it instead of having their um, kitchen staff do it? Well, they uh, used chocolate making as kind of a performance in the same way the tea service was a way of demonstrating your gentility, your um, fine taste, uh, and your hospitality. So chocolate pots often came out of the kitchen with their hot water and their chocolate paste melted into them already, but women would often season the chocolate at the table to give that again their unique flair with whatever spices or sweeteners they wanted to use. 
and then use this wood handle, the Molineo, um, to move your hands back and forth and whip that chocolate into a froth so it comes out um, very fresh and frothy. So that gives us a sense of how the consumption happened. And then of course, we don't wanna forget about the waste management. So just for fun, um, where did waste go in this time period? Well, one place, there are many places, but one place was down on the lower left to our friends, the pigs um, often found in city streets and who made their way up and down the curbs, eating whatever refuse had sort of been cast into the gutter that day. So it's always fun to include these details that um, sometimes go against our impressions of of the pristine nature of the past. So this helps us get a sense of what the, the food um, systems lens might offer um, if we look at a space like this. So taking another look here, um, what are some of the stories that you might be able to expand on or bring in to a room like this where we have a tea service and some baked goods and some spices and some people? Um, who could we add to the story as, as a character or more than one character? Who could we, um, what scent smells topics might you introduce here once that lens is um, dialed out a lot wider? I see a question in the chat. And while you're thinking about that, I'll just pause and answer that, which is, didn't men have a role to play in performance at the table with carving? Um, and I'll say absolutely yes. Carving of meats at the table is um, a really classic and a very long lasting tradition of sort of making that final motion in the serving of the meal. And with men, the association of handling the meat or the joint or the roast or whatever the biggest meat at the table was, was often um, just a sign of their, the masculinity and sort of being in the master role at the house. So that's a good question, thanks. So I'm not sure if folks are typing, but I'll just add some suggestions of, um, oh yeah, great, great. So children, we haven't seen children uh, here yet, but now we see some terrific ideas. Tea production, a fascinating story that you can get into. And as you explore the history, um, perhaps in your own area, I was able to do this at Strawberry Bank, and it becomes really fascinating to look at the newspaper advertisements from the 1750s, 60s, 70s, and notice the different kinds of tea that were being imported and where they were coming from, which really reflected changes in the international relations going on as tea merchants were negotiating um, with different British and American buyers. Um, so that was a very controlled industry and pretty interesting. And of course, there were fashions and flavors that changed. Um, over time, there were new new tea varieties that would become popular. So you could take a look into the advertisements and get into who's producing tea and how is tea prepared? How did it become such um, a, a demanded import item in the colonies? That's that's a wonderful thing to think about, um, as is also the, the shipping and transportation of the tea and all of the political realities that went along with that. Um, Marcy in the chat is saying the uh, enslaved people who helped to, to cook. And there, I have a wonderful book to recommend to you called Bound to the Fire that I, um, I know Samantha knows as well because we were both in a presentation where the author talked about enslaved cooks, how they did their work, the, the knowledge that they mastered and the way they really developed um, cuisine. Much of what we think of as American cuisine, we are now finding out through some pretty rigorous um, primary source scholarship was not just um, enslaved cooks following directions of mistresses and reproducing European cuisine, but in fact, really creating unique um, American flavor profiles, and cooking methods that blend African cooking um, practices and spicing traditions uh, and flavors with the, those that were available here in America, including the indigenous foods as well as European traditions. So they're really inventing a new cuisine. And that's something that you can explore endlessly. There's a, a whole lot of scholarship going on about that now. Um, People are bringing in a, a sharing of recipes. So there could be some look into these 
for instance, these, these tasty looking items on the side table, um, each of those presumably we could probably find sources for and talk about the elements in those recipes, ginger, cloves, even sugar, all of these are connected to very interesting food systems and stories. Their availability waxes and wanes in the era. Um, there are political repercussions to those. Um, all, of, all of the food systems do connect to the Atlantic world and the triangle trade and uh, slavery as well. So we're always going from these little things on the table to very, very big topics. Um, let's see, price and scarcity, uh, true of any product. So that piece about the marketing, someone mentions the vessels, the China, where does that come from? How is it handled? How, what do you need to do to wash that carefully and, and avoid um, breaking such precious things? Um, People talk about what are the specific roles that enslaved workers played uh, in both the formal and the private spaces of the house. And there are really interesting um, sources that we can find now about how that cuisine worked and what were what was the routine of the home during the day, who got up, um, you know, who got up early to begin that fire at 4 a.m. and begin uh, the processes that would keep that home fed and the meals on time all day long. Someone mentioned the attire, the wares. Uh, yeah, oh, thank you, Samantha's put in that, that wonderful book. Linen, spices, you guys are wonderfully full of imagination. So I hope that um, just this simple exercise starts to suggest how food isn't just food. Um, the, the, what we're seeing really represents a much wider wider uh, set of connections to the outer world. And any home is the endpoint of processes that begin thousands, thousands of miles away and involve thousands of people. Um, so that we can use the topic of food to really paint a much more vivid picture of the entire social world with that families lived in. A few questions are in the chat. Did early hot chocolate have just chocolate and water or was there a milk part and what else would they put in? Um, so both of those questions are um, in fact onto something. Usually there was a milk element involved and often there would be flavors that we probably wouldn't think of. Um, orange peel, lemon peel, there were spices, um, sometimes more savory spices than we might expect like pepper. Um, so they were, they were not the hot chocolate we know of, which is primarily sweet. It was more of a complex drink style. So that's wonderful. I'm really glad we've been able to take a look at using that food lens and that food systems lens. So I would encourage you to take this back to your work on your site and look at ways that you might be able to trace one of those threads uh, and begin to introduce either into your tours or your programs or your the interpretation that you display, some more of that complexity of the food history that um, you're likely available. So Anne in, in the chat is providing me a wonderful segue. Are you seeing museums leaning into this kind of interpretation? The answer is resoundingly yes. <coughs> um, and I'm excited about that. These topics uh, are definitely being explored by people in museums and to great effect. So I've brought a few examples of programs to share with you or explore for your own site. Um, so calling them programs with a food history lens. And this is um, a whole realm that you can begin to get into. And I'm just going to suggest a few starting points. This image here is of um, a festival at a historic house in Seattle. And those girls are using a cider press uh, to take apples and create apple cider. And through that process, learn a bit about the history of the place. Um, so one type of program that is sort of a perennial favorite is the dinners. Um, dinners have a long history. Uh, Old Sturbridge Village, Plymouth Plantation, they were among the earliest um, makers of historic dinners and historically themed dinners. But that, uh, that method, I would say, has started to fade away in favor of dinners that use heritage um, but a contemporary spin. So one of my favorite examples that I've recently been able to enjoy um, is the 
Historic Arkansas um, State Historic Agency has a wonderful museum. And in that museum, they do a program called History is Served, which is a series of dinners they do about four a year that feature Arkansas foodways. So each one has a unique theme. It might be African-American foodways in Arkansas. It might be um, immigrant cuisines that have come into the state. It might be the tomato. It was the summer, the tomato. So each has a theme and through that theme, the museum explores the history of a particular food and who was involved with it and what that sort of represents in the state's history. The museum provides um, written programs. So that's how one way they're able to share the interpretation and research they've done. And in the written program, it gives a description of the topic um, with a you know curatorial piece of writing that interprets that. And it also includes recipes and the menu for the evening. So prior to the pandemic, these were live dinners for about 40 people. And they were held at the museum in an event space that um, fortunately had uh, some kitchen facilities. So that does make it easier, but there are ways to work around if you don't. They would partner with a chef um, and they paid the chef a simple flat fee in order to, uh, it would, the chef would take that money and they could use it in whatever way they needed to, whether that was purchasing ingredients, hiring additional staff, um, or uh, whatever else they needed to do so that the chef took on the responsibility for orchestrating the entire meal and the museum staff were simply the host and producing partner and they even adapted this during the pandemic to curbside to go dinners uh, that also they gave away in these bags and people just swung by and picked them up and then took them home where they tuned into a virtual program where the chef talked about the meal. Um, so typically the chef would give people a guided experience and walk them through the foods that they were tasting. So History Served is a wonderful program. I encourage you to check that out. Um, another type of program I really enjoy is the talk and tasting. And that's not necessarily a full meal. Um, it's simply a uh, an array of small items that you might have a comparative tasting of to understand better what um, distinguishes one flavor from another, one food from another. And for example, this image is from what they call Cheese Geeks, which is a cheese tasting program. That's why they have the funny glasses on is that they're being cheese geeks. Um, but there is a leader who's basically guiding people through step by step the comparative tasting. I've done this successfully with apples, with heirloom apples. Um, so again, at Strawberry Bank, we were fortunate to have dozens of different heirloom apples, all of which have their own flavor qualities and their own uses. So through this comparative tasting, just eating a slice of an apple at a time and noticing which ones are tart, which ones are sweeter, which ones have a softer flesh, which ones are more crisp, um, which are better for cider, which are better for long storage, which are better for cooking with. All of these different applications were things that cooks um, and uh, home, any anyone working with food in the home had to know because making sure that you were using the right apple for the right type of process was part of the knowledge that a, a cook would have to have in order to not spoil the entire supply of provisions. Um, so I think one, one thing that this type of tasting can do is help to share those pieces of information that give us a greater respect and a sense of understanding um, for the, the amount of skill, knowledge, planning ability that a cook had to have, whether they were um, a servant or an enslaved person mattered not at all. It was still um, a really deeply uh, sophisticated profession. And this type of subtle distinction is part of that. Um, tastings can be wonderfully affordable because you don't need a tremendous amount of food volume. The value that you're adding is giving people the knowledge that goes with these things. So here's a wonderful program that was offered at the Enfield Shaker Museum, pairing up New England cider and cheese. And this was also a pandemic friendly program where you got, you took home your little picnic basket and you could tune into the talk and taste along with um, someone providing you the education on how the shakers themselves made their unique cheeses. Let's see, um, oops, that's 
cooking together. That should be a different image, but anyway, um, cooking programs are a classic as well. And using the facilities you have to cook actively can be a great way to engage people. Um, I noticed, uh, I still see, like to see what Strawberry Bank is doing and they've been doing hearth cooking classes um, that invite people right into their historic kitchen where there is an active hearth that can be used and cooked on and they together make a recipe or a meal. Also a wonderful way to teach preservation techniques, um, to teach baking. You can do all kinds of different things if you are able to provide a cooking facility. Now, if you don't, I mentioned I didn't want folks to just sort of give up if you don't have that ideal type of space. There are options um, for you, which one of which is to do programming with a partner at a different venue, but you can also um, rent or buy some lighter appliances that can be used almost anywhere. And one of the most popular today is the induction burner, which you just plug in. It's flameless, but it creates a really high heat just through contact. So it's a safe way to have a burner, for example. Um, so with an induction burner, a toaster oven, a water source, uh, you can really do quite a lot. And if you can't do full cooking, you can certainly do um, a tasting. Another thing that I love to see happening is gathering. The hearth is a beautiful place to be. Um, this is Clarissa Clifton is a food interpreter in Atlanta. And um, she does a number of programs that revolve around cooking, but also around discussion. And another nice program that we're seeing is um, the fireside talks that are being hosted at Strawberry Bank. So this is just an invitation for people to come into a room with a hearth in it, sit down, pull up a chair and have um, some discussion that is historically informed about how that house functioned, the art of preservation, how it worked, um, food preservation this is of course, uh, how it was done in the past and how many similar techniques are used today, whether it's through fermentation, drying, um, processing. There are so many, only so many preservation techniques and they can still um, be used to good effect today. Um, so things that I'd love to leave with you as ideas to kind of think about how you might approach a food program. One thing uh, at the top of my list that I put very high is that sense of accuracy and unvarnished honesty in the history we're presenting. Food is a delightful topic. I know I approach it with joy and, and that's um, something that I hope is infectious and, and that gets people excited about food and history. At the same time, there is so much that we know um, today and we are really aware of that is painful in the history of food um, including how it was grown, um, how it was secured and uh, procured and brought to the, the shores of the colonies, how it was distributed and who had access to it. Um, lots of foods are tied up with our history of enslavement, including um, the very story of rice, which if you um, want to explore that, there will be a book coming out um, called Rice by Michael Twitty, who's a really interesting food historian, and uh, really talks about how the only reason that rice could be cultivated here in the U.S. was that groups of people who were brought from Africa were already rice growing. Um, they were already a rice growing culture, and so they had the knowledge to uh, plant, harvest, and process rice that was unknown to the people here who were growing that as a, a cash crop. So I think that when we talk about food history, it's, um, it's an opportunity to talk about the complexities of food. And we do still experience these complexities today. Um, it's hard to grow food, it's expensive, and it's hard work to harvest and difficult. Um, and all of, all of the food that we grow here in the United States, of course, has a history. Um, the land history is an indigenous history. So we also need to talk about how our drive to have food and, and um, to establish places to grow food throughout, particularly the Midwest and West, had a lot to do with Indian removal. So we want to make those connections and audiences today are eager for us to, to have that, um, make those honest connections and really talk about how our food ways came together, how our cuisine was developed and uh, who had a role in that, whether or not their role was by choice or by coercion, um, there is still a lot of human creativity, ingenuity, collaboration evident in the history of American food. So we want to be, we want to be discussing 
embracing that and recognizing food is a very complex thing that brings people together across many boundaries of class and race and um, gender and all of those categories of identity. And we also want to be sure that we are showing and representing that. I think so often we we are, our eye does go to the beautiful tablewares of the parlor and to the gowns of the women and so forth. But we also want to be thinking about all of the people involved in the food system. And that includes workers, merchants, delivery people, and of course, um, the enslaved people or servants who might have been working in a home. So being sure that we're representing that true diversity of the food system and the diversity that existed in American history is important to our audiences. Um, we also want to be acknowledging when, when there's a class difference on display, um, we definitely, many of the homes that are preserved are of course elite homes. And I think we don't do it, we don't do anyone a service when we imply that everyone lived that way. That certainly wasn't true. What we're seeing are the aspirational, um, that the elements that were available in life to people with the greatest resources. And it tells us a lot about what they valued. They set sort of the standard for what what the rest of the society would consider beautiful and aspirational, but not everyone had access to that. Um, and the foodways of the poor and the middle class are also very interesting in their own right. And um, I recommend, uh, if for those of you that know the Townsend Company, they make historical reproductions that I'm sure many of you have purchased um, from. They also have a wonderful video series, including one called Feeding the Poor, that is um, just a lovely demonstration of the kinds of resourcefulness um, that people had to display to keep the bread coming in, uh, even on a very limited uh, living. So we want to be honest about that and to help people understand that diet, it was one place that class difference uh, was really in view. Um, last, I want to mention some qualities that people love, sensory experiences, even if you can't cook actively or do tasting on your site for any reason, um, you can provide smells, you can have spices, you can grate some fresh nutmeg and let people inhale that beautiful aroma that was so often used in a milk punch or um, on a, in a baked good. That's a wonderful way to begin bringing some of the sensory environment of the past alive, uh, as well as letting people handle foodstuffs, um, particularly dried ones, they're very durable. Um, and also to create that feeling, your programs can be places of conviviality and community just as much as of learning. So I love those fireside programs because they're really about sitting and talking and getting to know people, being in community together as we think about historical topics. Um, a few notes on where you might begin. I always think the first thing to do is inventory your site. What do you have? Just take a look at the different buildings or rooms or spaces or furnishings that you have to share. And I often lay them out on a matrix and say, for example, you put your food systems lens on and look at what do I have here that speaks to food production? Do I have a garden or um, you know, a, a field or a fishing fishing boat or anything like that? Um, is there an herb, herbs outside the front door? Uh, what do I have around processing? Where was food processed? Where was it stored? Often in a house, you can find um, really interesting things to talk about where there might have been a root cellar or pies might have been stored upstairs in a cold north bedroom. Um, the whole house in a way was used for food storage at times. You can put that distribution lens on. Where was it likely that this family got food? Where was the closest market? Where were the shops? Um, so inventory the assets that you have and then begin thinking about how those could be the basis for a program. Um, just a little glimpse at Mystic Seaport where the assets are many, but um, include lots of seafood facilities like an oyster house, um, the L.A. Dunton fishing schooner, and that richness of seafood resources has translated into a new program called Harvest of the Sea, which is um, a place to explore the histories of seafood, watching someone um, show how to fillet a codfish before you salt it down, learning about oyster farming and tasting oysters, and seeing um, the history of cod processing, and then how that dried salt cod was made into codfish cakes. So, you know, giving that full 360 is something you can do once you have your, your inventory um, and understand how food moved through your site. I also want to mention research. There are lots of places to go to research your site's unique food history. Some of these are listed here. 
um, always the account books and tax records that can tell you what homes had in them, um, what people were buying and selling, but also looking for those anecdotes and mentions of food that might just be one word or two in a journal or a diary or a letter. Um, please go to your newspapers and look to see what foods are being advertised for sale different times of year. And finally, we often turn to cookbooks. I know that's the first place that I turned when I got started on this work, but I've learned to be really careful with cookbooks because they are um, prescriptive. They talk about the kinds of foods people like to think of themselves eating, wanted to eat, um, or wanted to have on a special occasion, not necessarily what they ate every day. Uh, so that's something important to remember when we go back to those sources. And then finally, um, find your partners and allies. It's really good. Uh, food is something people love to connect over and food people tend to be very generous with their time and ideas. So just start striking up some conversations with local chefs or bakers that you admire, people that make candy, bread, um, cupcake stores, whoever it is you'd like to talk to. And often um, you may find some partners that are eager to join with you and do some programming together. Uh, other people to look at are people who are active in the food system, community gardeners, um, people in the hunger relief space are often really interested in doing some substantive food programming around history. You also, uh, in the U.S. states, every state has its Department of Agriculture, which may be a source of funds and unique programming possibilities. Um, and the garden clubs as well. There are some who focus on traditional or period style gardening. There's the Herb Society of America is a wonderful source for herb gardening and that has chapters in many states. Uh, and I also love to mention the USDA uh, Master Gardeners Program. Uh, they often have volunteers who help people to learn about gardening, who teach things like preservation, uh, food garden food preservation, um, and plant starting and things like that that might have a role in a program for you. So these are all just some places to get going. And I'm gonna stop on this final slide and see if we'd like to have a little bit of discussion about what this sparks for you. Are you using food at your site? Uh, are you inspired to look at it differently? And are there any obstacles that come up when you think about possibly raising, um, raising the topic of food for you? So thank you all so much uh, for listening to that that evangelism about food programming, and I'm eager for your questions. Well, as we start gathering those thoughts in the chat, uh, Michelle, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. For those sites who are currently actively serving food to our visitors, can you speak to the importance of staff training? Yes, um, thanks for asking. I think first I, I would like to note that often this is an obstacle people um, feel exists that may not be as onerous as it sounds. So I, I often hear from people, well, I know that we can't serve food on our site, when in fact they haven't yet begun to explore whether they can. And in fact, in many cases you can. The place to begin is with your um, health inspector, which is usually a municipal post, and you can begin by calling them up and saying, and you haven't done anything yet, but you're calling them up to say, we are interested in doing some food programming on our site. What do we need to know or do or have in order to do that? Um, you don't in most places need a commercial kitchen, uh, but you do need to be in communication with that body, um, that municipal body to make sure that you're adhering to the local guidelines. And often they will uh, come out to your site, evaluate it with you and make some recommendations. And those vary, it varies greatly from town to town, but quite often it's things about having hand washing facilities readily available or having separate sinks for food and hand washing or wearing gloves as you cook or distribute food. So they're relatively simple things. In most cases, I can't swear it's true everywhere, but in most cases, it's a conversation that you need to have. And then one thing that is an excellent tip is that you can, um, in most states, you can sign up for a program called Serve Safe, which trains food um, food workers in how to handle food safely. And if you or the staff that would be doing this sign up for a food safe certification and take that program, that is a huge boost of confidence for a municipal uh, person in municipal authority to say, oh, you take this seriously, you get it, um, you are going to be a safe food handler and we're not so, you know, we're not gonna be um, as concerned. So it's a good demonstration that you're 
that you're very serious about food safety. Um, and the staff do need to be trained in whatever practices are agreed with the health department and very rigorous and careful about adhering to that training because I don't think I need to paint the picture. It's just not something you wanna mess up with. Um, the consequences of foodborne illness are awful. So we wanna be as um, vigilant as possible and make sure that we're really honoring our um, agreements. We're getting some um, good questions and we have the entire time. I really am encouraged and proud of everyone for um, putting their thoughts down. Some of our visitors have been asking for specific programmatic advice. And Michelle, I just wanted to hear, are you available for consulting um, for our Great American Treasure sites? I absolutely am. I love working with sites to try to identify their food stories and amplify those. And um, I would be happy to do anything from a, a short phone consultation to talking about larger projects. So I'm I'm so pleased at all of the interest here that's evident in the chat. And, and I really believe this has the power to connect people with new uh, supporters for your site, new, new attendees and program participants. So I really hope everyone will explore it. And I invite you to be in touch and uh, talk about those ideas. We've had lots of questions about chocolate and tea. <laughs> um, I've tried to answer oh, yeah. them as I can in the chat, um, but it got me thinking, aside from perhaps the obvious, perhaps not, what is your favorite ingredient mm. and what is your favorite historic, historic ingredient and historic recipe? Oh, wow. That's a terrific question that I've never been asked. Um, okay, historic recipe. There's something called bird's nest pudding that is, um, it's a baked apple, baked apples in a custard. And it is so delicious and just not something you'd run across in your average, you know, modern cookbook. Um, but it's absolutely wonderful and, and I recommend it. So that's good. And then oh, ingredient, yeah, you, what's that? It's a, it's a 19th yeah. century. Yeah, it's, it's a rich egg custard, it's vanilla, and then the, the apples are left whole and baked inside the custard and it's just delightful. <laughs> and then um, you heard me going on and on about nutmeg. I kind of love nutmeg. I think that's probably my favorite ingredient because you know it's just got that incredible fragrance. It really elevates everything and it goes well with sweets and savories. So, so mm -hmm. I'm a nutmeg girl. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I did see this great question. Were, were people healthier because of their food? And I think, you know, that's a, it's a complicated question. So you first have to say, well, which person, um, certainly the diet of the poor was not very nutritionally rounded. People ate a lot of bread if they were poor and, um, a fair amount of fat, but not a lot of just pure protein meat was just not available and that let fewer vegetables than one would think. Um, and then on the other end, the, the wealthy often had diseases of overconsumption. So things, you know, with drinking large amounts of alcohol, eating a lot of rich foods. Um, so gout, you know, is kind of a more common illness as well as a lot of like digestive illnesses. So I think you have to look at those extremes. Um, but uh, it's, and of course, spoilage was more of a problem. So people's meats were either very heavily salted um, or it was eaten in season when they were freshly butchered. Um, so there was a lot of variability seasonally in the diet. So I feel like they may have been healthier in some ways, but they also had different health problems than we have today from our diet. And I certainly think the shorter supply chain that much of the food had was probably better um, in some ways, but uh, it was also already a very global food world by the 1700s. So uh, the food miles issue we have today is, is not new. <laughs> um, food was going thousands of miles back then as well. And I would add health, um, the perception of what is healthy and is not healthy. Yeah, um, absolutely. Over time. <laughs> fun to think about. Mason, yeah. uh, George Mason, so sorry, we're on a partial name business, um, frequently talked about gout and complaints of digestion and other things. And he probably created his own problems habitually. <laughs> I to say. Sorry, George. One of my favorite things is seeing the people praising sugar. Sugar was a health food until the late 19th century, early 20th century. Yeah. It was children need lots of sugar for energy workers. You know, it was really a positive. <laughs> When we traveled to Spain, uh, they kept serving me warm milk for my one-year-old with sugar, and I kept asking why. <laughs> so, <laughs> to this day, 
<laughs> oh, that's neat. Michelle, this has been such a pleasure. I hope we can host you again. Um, in the meantime, if others have more questions, please leave them in the chat. Um, we can also pass them on to her. I'm sure we can find ways um, to make sure they get answered. Also, um, you're going to notice that there is another link for a survey in the chat. If you have great feedback for us, please leave it there. We really appreciate every opportunity to make this a better presentation because we're going to keep going with um, the virtual format. So um, I would like it. I know Michelle would like it. Uh, please take a couple minutes and complete that. Have a great evening, Michelle. Um, for everyone else, we're going to take a quick break and then rejoin at five o'clock. We'll reopen Zoom at 445.